the MRL Historic Touring Car Challenge at the Silverstone Festival Saturday morning action. And for the first time, this mixed field of touring cars will be part of the entertainment on a very wet Silverstone circuit. And uh, among those who are in the field, lots who will have known uh, intimately the, the late Neil Brown, competition race driver turned engine builder of enormous renown, uh, built engines for all sorts of different categories, and most recently particularly uh, was very heavily involved in building racing engines for historic touring cars and historic racing, and uh, along with Richard Dutton, his I'm not going to say partner in crime, but partner in crime. Uh, he also returned to the racetracks uh, with uh, great enthusiasm in historic racing. And Neil Brown sadly passed away uh, just a, a short while ago, a uh, member of the BRDC and uh, an enormous friend to many, many people in the paddock. So uh, we will think of him and uh, remember Neil Brown and all the efforts that his company has put into keeping racing engines competitive. Uh, all the guys from Team Dynamics had a long and very successful relation with Neil Brown engines and they're not alone so they will be uh, I'm sure happy to remember him with a big smile on their face so cars heading out onto a very wet Silverstone circuit yesterday we had rain only for the very final qualifying session at about 7 in the evening so nobody this weekend is a test day on Thursday was dry as well. Nobody has splashed around Silverstone yet in these cars. And as you can see, there is a lot of heavy horsepower rear wheel drive machine. There's the Geo Commodore, the VLSS. And that car again, boasting uh, uh, just north of 500 horsepower and rear wheel drive. Um, Sanyo Rover, the Patrick Motor Group Rover. Got three litre Capris, DTM BMW M3s with Chevy Camaros. Again, that 1275 GT Mini, look for that. I think the Mini, what? Is it maybe not as wet at the Beckett's S's as it needs to be for the Mini? You can see the Commodore leaving a big shower of spray behind it coming down from Cops Corner. But on this side of the circuit, not only is the sun out, it looks like they rather escape the rain shower because at Luffield, afternoon, sir. Is it afternoon? No, I haven't had lunch. It's still morning. Um, at this side of the circuit looks very, very wet indeed. So this is going to be a mixed bag. So we may well end up with some of the cars having to nurse their tyres a little bit because everybody, I'm sure everybody's so watch. I can't imagine anybody going, yep, yeah, it's slicks weather. Apart from Jonathan Lewis, he do not do that to wind you up. So again, look, it, it is dry here. There are no wet tracks at all. How's that happened? And it's, it's, a, it's a big sight, Silverstone. It does happen, but I mean, we're not spa. You know, that's a, half the circuit is bone dry, and the other half is absolutely soaking wet. Yes, looking here on our live stream at uh, Stowe and Club Corners, and uh, the track looking quite dry there. But there's you can the, see the yeah, line where it was, just, yes. just past the bridge shadow where the rain starts. That's where it, that's where the, there are two different halves to this circuit. Half is bone dry. So now then, right, like I said, no question at all it's wet weather tyres because everybody here is in the wet paddock getting rained on. The question is, did they all go for wet weather tyres or have half the field gone, no, nah, still slicks. Now the clock has started running, so even then, though they're behind a, a safety car on a formation lap, there are slick tyres waiting. Um, but did, any, did anybody start on slicks? Because if they have, they're going to have to survive a few half laps of opposite lock bravery on the lock stops and, and back again, and hopefully not bin it. But if you don't have to stop, you could gain yourself a lot of time. Everybody will have to make their mandatory pit stop, but that's pretty much a level, level playing field. If you don't have to stop for tyres, you could gain a lap on the field. And the cars at the back of the field in the second grid, they must run on uh, treaded tyres, so they haven't got that dilemma. Whereas these cars at the front in period ran on slicks or wets, so uh, they will have chosen. And I think probably sitting in the heritage pit lane, they will have chosen wets. Well, look, I mean, just look at the spray. What speed are they doing? 40 miles an hour? Not even. And look at the spray that's being thrown up here. At, at a near standstill, it's absolutely flooded here. The Watson's water delivery from the, uh, on the RS500. Well, those who haven't chosen slicks, 
and are starting on wets, which from this end of the circuit look like absolutely the right choice, are still struggling to find the grip. But now, if you're on wets, you're now paranoid that all of your opposition might be on slicks. I noticed one car there was uh, sliding around on the straight, and one of the Capris, and I think yeah. it was the uh, Andy Wolf car, the 63 car, which will be taken over by uh, Aston Martin works driver Darren Turner. Uh, and I wonder, and it may just have been uh, him testing the grip, but I wonder whether that was an indication that he's on slicks. That's a tough yeah. choice, isn't it? it? It might be, mightn't it, that, you, that you're sort of on the throttle, on the brakes, on the throttle, on yes. the brakes, trying to bring some warmth into the brakes, particularly in the tyres. But again, you know, you come down into the Beckett's S's out of, out of the soaking wet part of the circuit, and then suddenly there's all the grip. But, but your wet weather tyres are going to be begging for mercy. And it, it is absolutely soaking around us, absolutely. but two-thirds of the lap, at least three-quarters of the lap almost, is bone dry. It's almost look, like we're looking at a different race with those. Yes. The cars at the back of the grid are still going through the, re, uh, the wet patch, and here's the leaders on the totally dry hangar straight. And, and as the safety car leads them around slowly, the track is drying faster now. They're not putting heat into the tyres yet, but they will destroy the wets very quickly on two-thirds lap. Lights out on the safety car, so we will go green this time round. The clock is running, so this 50-minute race has already started behind the safety car. You see the blue Calsonic Nissan of Rick Wood weaving there to bring some heat into the tyres. See, if you've got four-wheel drive, is that like a brave pill? Do you then go, I've got four-wheel drive, I'm going slicks? I don't know. I don't know. This could be highly entertaining. And what we will have to try and keep our eye on is who dives into the pits long before the pit lane window opens. So the race already underway, but the safety car has pulled in. They've had a couple of looks at the track and they know what awaits them. Right now it is bone dry. Our pole setting car, Paul Mensley, with Julian Thomas alongside in the Calibre Sierra. Then the red and black Advan Nissan Skyline of James Hansen. And they go green this time round. And there, the Watson's Water RS500 coming steaming down the inside. That's a, a livery from the uh, races in Macau. Watson's Water, one of the local sponsors there. And it is the two RS500s that lead away. The Cologne Capri, that is Richard Kent, the white and blue car from fourth on the grid. And a very gentle start from James Hansen in the red and black Advan Skyline. He's got the uh, David Tomlinson RS500. David Tomlin going up the inside, didn't quite squeeze through. And right here, this is horsepower territory, but as they come down towards the rain, already you can see the Capri starting to make moves. Richard Kent in that white and blue Capri. Now, though, however, let's see what the Skylines can do. Rick Wood, three wide, he's on the outside as they sweep into Brooklands. And looks as though Julian Thomas went in very deep there, manages to get around Luffield. They're all trying to go the long way around the outside. We've got a spinning BMW. The outside line at Luffield is where there isn't any rubber on the road. But look at this. If you're in the middle of the pack below the top six or so, you're seeing nothing at all here. There is somebody in the pit lane at the moment waiting to leave the pits. Not sure who that is. That looks like a BMW roof. Here's our lead battle. The pole man is Paul Mensley. Julian Thomas right behind him in the ex Andy Rouse Calibre Sierra. And these two are romping away at the moment. And it's a Sierra up into third place as well. That's David Tomlin in the green, white, and red car. And I think that Capri that was in third place, uh, challenging almost for the lead, when it got onto the wet, it dropped way back and started slithering around. I think he might be on slicks, uh, which was uh, probably the car I saw sliding around on the warm-up lap as well. And there it is at the top of the screen now, those two blue Capris. Just keep an eye out on this dry side of the track. Right, but what has happened to the flame-breathing skylines? They've just basically selected reverse and gone backwards. The best of them is in sixth position. Car number two make that seventh place. Rick Wood down in eighth place. And Henry Neal and uh, Nick Wales' car now up into ninth place, car number 99, ahead of Steve Soper in uh, his uh, Mustang. So all sorts of combinations of cars here. There's the first of the Cologne Capris. 
and looking no, pulls it over immediately. I thought he was looking for a drive in a track, but pulled over out of the way. And that is the Kenton Osborne car. And that car seems to have come to a grinding halt. It has come to a grinding halt. So, again, that's Richie Kent, Joe Osborne. And he's shaking his head, isn't he? He's not happy. Change of lead. Into the lead goes Julian Thomas. So Julian Thomas taking the lead in the Calibre Sierra. Right behind him, Paul Mensley, who started on pole position. And the lead car is an original car, the, the one driven by Andy Rouse and Guy Edwards, the black car behind a recreation, but obviously to the same specification as they hit the wet part of the track. And uh, Julian Thomas taking it very, very steady into Luffield. Paul Mensley comes up alongside, will try and perhaps the cut back as they come out of Luffield. Yes, he's trying for the tighter line to maybe get the lead as they exit through Woodcut Corner. Now, what we need is a two-litre battle behind with Steve Soper in the BMW and John Clennard in the Cavalier as, as uh, the ex Andy Rouse Sierra. So you'd have the likes of Tim Harvey, Lawrence Bristow and all those guys in there in the Air Sierra Cosmos at the front of the field and the two-litre battle behind. We've got that going on. Well, there you go. There's a, an RS 1600 Mark 1 Escort and a five litre um, right behind it in the, the holding Commodore. And again, change for the lead. Paul Mensley back in front of Julian Thomas as they come out of the wet and back into the dry. It's the opposite to going through the tunnel at Monaco, isn't it? <laughs> Where you go often from a wet circuit to the dry. And the uh, David Tomlin, um, Sierra Cosworth, the Watson's water livery, which was uh, so familiar at Macau over the years, up to third place. And uh, the Cologne Capri, the better of the two of them, now in fourth spot. That's Andy Wolf at the wheel. So Andy Wolf challenging David Tomlin, but down into Stowe Corner, Paul Mensley uh, leads. Uh, Julian Thomas thinks about a wider line, maybe a cut back here. There's another opportunity to come out tighter, but he stays behind as they start to drop down now into the Vale, and we've got a safety car. OK, so I'm not sure who is off where. We certainly saw that Cologne Capri slowing down and stopping. I was just about to say, there is now a dry uh, line. Well, actually, uh, as a Lotus Cortina comes past us on the lock stops out of Luffield, uh, a drier line, but if you get on the curbs on the inside, which you try and tend to do at Luffield, uh, then you get a big handful of opposite and the safety car ready to join. Our leaders come very slowly across the line, so all the gaps that they had opened up will disappear. Uh, who started the number eight car? Was that Steve Soper? It was. He started the BMW M3, and there he is, uh, up to eighth place ahead of the Calsonic skyline of Rick Wood. That's the blue skyline. So soap has got a, a new Mustang that uh, he and Henry Mann are racing uh, in another race. And, and is it because of where the Capri is right by the racing line? I think that might be the reason we've got a safety car. So we need to rescue that. That's uh, one of the very few places on the circuit where the marshals can't really recover the car safely under racing conditions because uh, it's a long way round to the pit exit before they can push that back uh, into safety. A lovely shot there of uh, the Eggenberger colours, Mike Manning's Sierra RS500, number 35, in the red and black colours. And Steve Soper drove a car very much like that. Uh, there isn't really a car in this race that Steve hasn't had a, uh, a season in as a works driver. Curiacos Cavalier. Yeah, that's true, <laughs> yes. Although he was in a Cavalier at one stage. Well, he drove into it in his BMW. Oh, so. yes, that's <laughs> true. Yes, yes. Uh, so, yes, unfortunately, the, uh, the Cologne Capri, yes, esoteric qu um, quote, uh, the Cologne Capri, Richard Kent, um, yeah, he stopped at the start-finish line, then tried to drive out of harm's way, and clearly the car has refused to go any further. So we press our honourable Land Rover into service. Now, it's the first time the Landy's been used uh, for a, a land grab, and that will... Uh, and hence the safety car, because you can't have slow-moving cranes driving around while cars are going at racing speed. Now then, let's assume that nothing has gone wrong mechanically with the skylines. Rigwood is down in seventh place, and that is the best of them. I know, there's the Advan car, which is a little further up the order, but they are all sort of struggling a bit. Yeah. So. Let's assume that they started on slicks, otherwise they should really have made more headway. Anybody who started on wets now 
This is going to save them because they undoubtedly were thinking, my wets are already dying on lap two or lap three. So they are now going, this is fantastic. This will keep my tires alive until the pit lane window opens. We've had 11 minutes and 43 seconds. The pit lane window opens after 15 minutes of the race. I know the time is 11.15, so uh, 50 down to 30. So we've had 13 minutes, just, just under 13 minutes of the race run. So in two minutes, the pit lane opens, which means that the next time they come round, in theory, the pit lane window should be open. Whether they are allowed to stop and do their driver changes behind the safety car or not, I'm afraid is beyond my ken. So I'm not quite sure whether they'll be able to stop behind the safety car or whether they're going to need to push the pit stop window. But I think we're getting to the situation where anybody who's on wets is going, yep, we're going to stop immediately, get off these wets. And with the driver change, plus the extra 60 seconds that they'll need to sit stationary, that should be enough to do the tyre change without losing any time. Although, as you can see, they're not centre lock wheels. They're all, um, almost everybody's on um, multi nut wheel guns. So it is not going to be a quick process. A couple of uh, standout uh, performances that we've seen. But one I mentioned is Matt Neal, who started the Nick Whale uh, car 55. And he's up 11 places on the opening laps to eighth. Right, the Cologne Capri has been withdrawn, as has the safety car. We are back to green flag racing. Safety car boards just coming in down at the first corner. Here comes uh, the uh, Watson's Sierra down the inside, moves up into fourth place. So that's the Goffs, car number 16. So we've got Sierra Cossus, one, two, three, four at the moment. And the Cologne Capri in fifth place. And Matt Neal up another place in that early part of that uh, lap after the safety car and uh, an, an extra driver we've got who's actually started the car is Andy Middlehurst in number two. Aha, uh -huh. I wondered if it was Middlehurst or Hansen. Now, see, again, you would expect him to be a long way up the order. That's the, uh, you see, one, two, three, the blue Calsonic Nissan. Uh, Andy Middlehurst is in the red and black Advan Nissan further back. Look at the Capri hunting for the wet on the track. Now, that suggests to me that he has started on wets or maybe he was just looking to make an inside pass there on the Sierra. He's already made up two more spots. So 117 is the um, is not the Watson's car. That's the uh, the Welsh Tortoise, and the Watson's car is car number 16. So that's now in third place or uh, fourth place now as the Cologne Capri has moved up two spots. There it is. So the Capri making hay while the sun shines or not. This is Andy Wolfe in the white and blue Cologne Capri. That's the car that I surmised might be on slicks. And uh, Matt Neal made another place. He's got past Rick Wood as well in the blue Calsonic skyline. And there's wow. uh, Matt Neal at the back of that group in the BMW. Absolutely fine, Matt Neal. Of course, he really made his name and his money in a BMW in, uh, as the first privateer to win a British touring car race outright in a red Team Dynamics M3. He is now closing in on the back of the Sierras, and again, all full battle out front. Now we have got a couple of early pit callers, so the pit window is open. Uh, the Bryant family have brought in car number 129, Graham and Ollie Bryant in their Chevy Camaro, the white and black car with that sort of lurid colour scheme. Meanwhile, out front is Julian Thomas in the calibre Sierra, starting to run away with this at the moment. Again, even the wet parts of the track here by the national pit lane are considerably drier than they were just a few minutes ago. Car number eight, Steve Soper at the wheel of that BMW. And right in the middle with uh, the blue Calsonic Nissan of Rick Wood in front. And coming up underneath him uh, very quickly, Andy Middlehurst. 
Capitalhurst won a couple of national saloon car titles in Skylines in period. And now suddenly the Skylines seem to be switched on. And they're starting to move back up the order, spitting flame on the upshifts and on the downshifts. And the Nick Whale Escort, the yellow and black car in the background, started to pick up ground as well. Oh, and a spin for our pole man, Paul Mensley, out of second place, or out of what was third place. And that means the Max Goff started, and Ian Goff also co-driven Cosworth is up to second place so there's a big battle behind and in the spray it's actually turning into quite a titanic tussle for third down to about 10th place and I think Andy Middlehurst has got ahead of the uh, similar Nissan of Rick Wood so it's the red and black um, Nissan that is now ahead of the blue one. So Andy Middlehurst, like you say, these Nissans have suddenly switched on, haven't yeah. they? And uh, Middlehurst has uh, made his way through. He'll be handing over to James Hansen, another very, very quick driver. Strong pairing. So they went backwards in the rain, and now they're coming forwards that it's drier. I do think that possibly they may well have started on slick tyres. Little looping spin for Ben Gill's RS 1600 Escort. There's the Cologne Capri, which is in third place. And Middlehurst now up to fifth, Rick Wood to sixth. Matt Neal getting shuffled a bit further back down the order in that black and yellow Escort. And into the pits has come the car we just saw spin, the number 22 Paul Mensley car that led early on. Andy Middlehurst carving across the nose of the Cosworth there of David Tomlin. Here's the battle for the lead and it's a change. So through goes the red, white and green car. Max Goff takes the lead of the race away from Julian Thomas. Julian's done a great job out front. The Watson's water livery car is now our race leader. So again, not sure who raced that in period, but Watson's water, very much a, a Macau associated sponsor. Used to see that lots of times arriving on uh, cars for the Formula 3 race and the Macau touring car race. And behind the ex Andy Rouse team at ICS Caliber Sierra in second place. Everybody battling for third as the Cologne Capri swap positions. Up to third place now is the Advan Skyline. Fourth place, Rick Wood in the blue Calsonic Nissan. And fifth and sixth are the two Cologne Capris now. Matt Neal in seventh, and he's been caught by David Tomlin, who's steaming down the inside. The first, of the, through. the first of those Capris is a couple of laps behind, because it, uh, or at least two laps behind, if not more, yeah. because it went into the pits, of course, uh, on the back of the Land Rover. Ah, oh, so that's rejoined. OK, yes. excellent. So that's uh, 88, which is um, Richard Kent. Now, we think we've had a, a spin for David Tomlin in that red, white and green Cosworth one with the uh, tortoise on the side. Batty Boo uh, sponsorship, uh, not an original car, but uh, sponsored Thierry Bootson in period. Uh -huh. And a couple of M3s coming steaming by as well. Car number 10, Mark Smith driving on his own in the Vinterschall liveried XDTM Warsteiner BMW, just ahead of the Fina livery. And uh, we're now lapping our smaller capacity cars, the 1600 twin cam Lotus Cortinas, of course the uh, fastest touring cars of their era in the early 60s. Now Andy Middlehurst and Rick Wood really setting about charging to the front of the field in the skylines. I'm pretty convinced then that these, are, well they, if they are on wet and with four wheel drive it spreads the load across all four wheels rather than rears only so it sort of helps preserve the tyres. I wonder whether they did start on slicks. This is the battle for third then. And the uh, Capri behind is Wim Kuhl, the Dutch driver in that blue and white Cologne Capri. So those Capris with their Cosworth GA V6 engines built to take on the BMW CSLs in European touring car and German touring car racing. 
So a very different generation, looking at a Capri from the 70s and Skylines from the 90s, racing nose to tail. And our race leader, Max Goff, is absolutely charging away. Got the fastest lap of the race, 220.886. And again, you wonder now who did start on wet and who did start on slicks. I'm not sure that Goff could really be holding that pace if he started on wet weather tyres. We do know with Paul Mensley, uh, who had that spin, he uh, made an early stop and changed to slicks. And he's back out again. So it's be interesting to watch his times, assuming the car is OK, now that Michael Lyons is on board. Yeah. So we've only had about 10 cars stop. Bryant, Michael Lyons, you say, has just left the pit lane. And all our front runners remain out front. I think Matt Neal will probably run this escort deep into the race before he hands over to Harry Honeywell. So Nick Whale, over the last few years, who raced BMWs in the British Truck Car Championship in period, has raced with his son, but they have split up. He's now father versus son. And in fact, Matt Neal is also racing his son, Henry, in uh, one of the races this weekend. So Henry in a Lotus Cortina. And so too is the late Steve Neal, Matt's dad's ashes, are part of the ballast in the Lotus Cortina. In fact, Henry Neal in another of the races with Gordon Shem. A little moment there for our pole man, Paul Mensley. Uh, Michael Lyons. Oh, Michael Lyons. Oh, right, so on slicks. he has taken over, right, so... And, and that's probably a measure of uh, being on slicks on the wet part of the track because yes. Michael overran the corner, not able to get the car slowed up. Matt Neal, we're seeing here the uh, Escort Mark One, two-litre engine. Iconic, they're the uh, sponsor, the new name for Nick Wales' company, which has been known for a number of years as Silverstone Auctions. They now change their name to Iconic Auctions. They also have an auction going here at Silverstone. Now then, this is Andy Middlehurst up into second place ahead of Julian Thomas. So car number two, the uh, Advan Tysan Skyline, the uh, red and black has moved up into second place ahead of Julian Thomas and Rick Wood's gone through for third as well. Julian Thomas losing ground because here comes Vim Kuhl as well uh, with the Cologne Capri looking down the inside of the Calibre Sierra. So it's still Max Goff who leads and by 11 and a half seconds so he's steaming away from these Nissans at five seconds a lap. 220.8 his fastest lap compared compared to 225 for the fastest lap of the skylines and into the pits comes julian thomas to hand over to callum lockie and the leader in as well the goth sierra in the pits as well okay so number eight bmw steve soper who will hand over to darren fielding he moves up the order in comes the capri of vim cool and soper carries on now, if you're driving on your own, you just sit around for three minutes, basically, while the pit stop happens around you, and then head back out. And I thought there was going to be a driver change. I wonder if Ian Goff has decided not to take over, or if that has already been affected. Max Goff handing over to Ian Goff. We'll wait and see. So Andy Middlehurst leading from Rick Wood. They were working their way up to the front of the field, weren't they, Alistair? So let's see exactly what the pit stops mean for them. Yes, it'll be interesting to see when they choose to come in because they're um, Rick Wood solo, so it really doesn't matter when he comes in. John Wood and James Pixford's Lotus Cortina there at the side of the track. So that has stopped. Now, interestingly, on our entry list, we've got Max and Ian Gom listed. On the timing screen, Max and Ian Gom. But there is another Gom. No, Goff. There. Oh, that's Goff, rather. Yeah, so Joe Gom. Yeah, no, so Goff's right, OK. So I wondered if the timing screen had caught up with something that we weren't aware of. Again, with your minimum pit stop time of 60 seconds, plus the pit lane delta, which is 20.2, which is what it takes to go from the pit in beacon to the pit out beacon at 60 k's. It all adds up to a total time of 80.2 seconds. Plus another 60 for the, those Plus cars. Another 60 yeah. for those cars as well, yeah. So you're going to lose 
2 minutes 20 on a, a lap that's just over 2 minutes 20. You lose very nearly an entire lap sitting in the pit lane. But of course, everybody does. Rick Wood with uh, the name of touring car youngster Jake Hill also on the side of the car. So Jake's clearly had a, a bit of a run out in this car before now. Not here, though. And there is the car that is the race leader. Look how little spray there is as they come down the pit straight. It is drying fast. That's one of the advantages of it being a relatively warm morning so far, is that the rain is being uh, evaporated and driven away by the tyres. And what was streaming wet when they were on their formation lap is now just sort of dampish. And that is uh, confirmed by the fact that Michael Lyons has just set the fastest lap of the race, and we know he's on slicks. 219.592, which is a good two, well, one and a half seconds quicker than the leading cars. So uh, I think that's the uh, the signal that anybody who hasn't already decided to change onto slicks needed. And yet the pit lane is still very wet. On pit apron is very wet. The pit entry road is very wet as it has so few cars coming down. So still lots of slicks waiting for some of our teams. I'm not. Yeah, 22 minutes remaining on the clock. Not sure you're going to survive on wet weather tyres if you started on them for another 20 minutes or so. Of course, you'll spend two of those 20 minutes in the pit lane. But there go the Nissans. They're starting to really carve their way past everybody. And uh, we watched the Goffs pit stop and we didn't see them change tyres. They may have done, but we didn't see it. And it takes a while. So I, I don't think the Goffs changed, which suggests they may have been on uh, slicks to start with. Nobody really had much of an advantage over anybody else early on. And then suddenly once the safety car pulled and that's the end of the race for Callum Lockie. Bails out of the Calibre Sierra. Very disappointed. Now, is he in the barriers? He is in the barriers. A rare day when Callum Lockie puts a wheel off, never mind the entire car off into the tyre wall. So our guys in the EVS department may have a replay of that. Meanwhile, Matt Neal is out, helmet off, stopwatch in hand. That was on wets, so slicks going on. It's not a fast process, so they're going to get all hands on deck. And that means that they're probably not going to bring in the Mark I car at the same time that they got the Mark II on deck because they will need all the hands they can. In comes Rick Wood from second place. It can be interesting if the camera can pick him up to see whether he was on slicks, trying to see on Middlehurst car whether he is or not. And Kuhl comes in from third place in the Capri as well. And here again is our pole sitting black Sierra. So now cars all over the place, up and down the order. And Michael Lyons in that black car is charging up the field now. He's up to 30th, which doesn't sound great, but he was 42nd when he came out of the pits. And he's now done a 218.592. And we've got a camera on Rick Wood, as you asked, for this. Uh, it doesn't look like they're changing tyres. No, they it? are slicks, aren't yes, they? I think they that's are. why the Skylines didn't make much progress early on. Now, Michael Lyons, fastest race laps and all that, he is in 30th place. In front of him, there are only three cars that have not stopped. So it's not like suddenly the rest of the field is going to dive in in front of him and, and he'll get a lap back. Now, has the leader missed the pit window? That's from 15 minutes to 30 minutes in the race. There are less than 20 minutes to go. Pit window is closed. The leader has made a mistake and they will have a penalty for that. They have missed the window as the safety car comes out. That may be to rescue that Cortina. Again, it seems a long way off the racing line. The safety car comes out of the Formula One pit lane, as everybody else. And in fact, there's another pit caller going in very late, a BMW. Car number 61, that's missed the window as well. That's Tom Holbrook's uh, E30 M3. I think there are three then that have missed that one you've just mentioned. Jamie Sturgis in the 535 BMW and, most importantly, our leader. Katsuyuki Hoshino and Suyo Suzuki, the drivers, I think, of that Calsonic Nissan. You could see Hoshino's son still racing. Hoshino still runs the team in Japanese GTs and touring cars. Well, whatever the penalty is, it? is it 
minute penalty for missing the pit stop window. Uh, I think it will be at least that. Um, it's a 30 second penalty if your transponder not working and making life difficult for the time. Uh, uh, if you miss the pit window, it still make your pit stop, you get a drive through penalty. If you don't make your pit stop at all, you're excluded. Well, they are making their right. pit stop by the looks of it. Uh, is that the... Yeah. Yeah. That's the Middlehurst Hanson car now. Yeah. Uh, so... so big mistake by the team not flagging Andy Middlehurst in in time. So he will have to do a drive through as well as the pit stop. And again, we did see the pit window open after the safety car, the first safety car pulled in. Whether you're allowed to make a driver change behind the safety car or not is another layer of rules that I'm not aware of, you I'm can, afraid. yes. You can, okay, well, they're still gonna have to do a drive-through. So again, that was a, a big error by the team. And also, uh, of course, their pit stop being in the uh, newer, amongst the newer cars will be a two minute plus the in and out time. And at the side of the road is the car that was on pole position. So Michael Lyons took that car over. He set a couple of fastest race laps and now uh, from 25th place rolls to a halt. You can see underneath the car, the, uh, what looks like the air jacks, um, not completely withdrawn, but Rick Wood's car, the Tysan Advan Skyline in the pit lane. So any hope. Uh, that's not Rick Wood, rather, by there, the uh, Middlehurst James Hansen car. There is Rick Wood. So Rick Wood currently lying in third place. But not in the safety car queue. So our race leader appears to be Vin Coyle in the Cologne Capri. So that's the white and blue Capri, car number 53. And second is the Calsonic Skyline, car number one, two, three of Rick Wood. With in third place, car number 35. So third we haven't talked about, Mike Manning's black Sierra Cosworth. So everybody is utterly jumbled up. Almost everybody completed their pit stops successfully. The Land Rover is back on track for recovery of the Lotus Cortina. So lights remain out on the safety car until they come round again to start finish this time. Well, there goes James Hansen. Hansen started his career in single seaters, then in touring cars. He finished the European Touring Car Championship. And, uh, successful historic car racer. He and his father run Speedmasters, who deal in historic racing cars particularly. And there's lots of work for the Landy to do. It's going to the newest and most precariously perched of them, which is our uh, pole-sitting Sierra Cosworth. I think they will probably leave the Lotus Cortina, because that's a long way off on very much the wrong part of the road for somebody hopefully to go off, although the reason they have barriers there is because it is possible to go off. Uh, the Curia Cost Cavalier also late into the pit lane. And there is the Calibre Sierra as parked in the barriers firmly by Callum Lucky. It's painful dragging it through that gravel, isn't it? Yeah. So, I'd forgotten that that car was off as well. So our, our race director has got several cars that he needs to rescue, hence the safety car to do them in safety. Is that Wets going? I can't be putting Wets onto the Cavalier, can we? I, I think it is, yes, Wets going onto the uh, what, what do they know about the weather forecast that we've had? <laughs> well, Ga Gary and John are very local, aren't they, the Pearsons? So, uh... Right, we've, we've uh, used up the slicks, but we've got Wets, so we're done, we're going to use them now. So, this, so I imagine it will stay with slicks on the back, although, although predominantly this is rescuing our, our pole-sitting car which is in a very precarious position. We had a safety car for car stranded there a little earlier on as well. That's when the first safety car came out. That's at the end of the Formula One pit straight and right on the line on the inside or, or inches off the line, um, but also a chance to recover the uh, uh, Julian Thomas Callum Lockie caliber Sierra that was off at Cops Corner. We haven't seen a replay of that, so clearly it happened out of sight of the cameras, or while the cameras were following somebody else. 
Looking there at car number 25, that's the FINA BMW, and that car in fourth place. So the safety cars and the pit stops and the weather have really shuffled up the order. That's Nick Bartlett's BMW as the 22 car of Paul Mensley and Michael Lyons gets towed away. Well, they have ended up with the fastest race lap, 2 minutes 18.59, which is a couple of seconds quicker than anybody else has managed to go so far. But as the track continues to dry, that may change. So some period liveries a decade apart. There's the Calsonic Nissan from the early 90s, just in front of it from uh, the early to mid 80s British touring cars is the Sanyo Rover and by TWR for drivers like Jeff Allen and the uh, Daily Express SO sponsored Patrick Motor Group Rover behind. Brian Yogi Muir raced in British touring cars and races here like the Tourist Trophy. SD1, a three and a half litre V8, was uh, a very formidable weapon. Won and then in the courts later lost the British Touring Car Championship, won the European Touring Car Championship. So there's the uh, blue and yellow Patrick Motor Group Road going through. So three of the SD1s make a fabulous sound, great looking car. And just behind uh, one of those SD1s, the Chevrolet Camaro, which in an earlier period was dominant with Stuart Graham at the wheel. Yep. And, uh, he won tourist trophy one of the years in a car like that so each uh, maybe two three year period you have a dominant car which then either gets superseded by the manufacturer so disappears or their manufacturer supported gets replaced uh, they, they tend to get legislated out of competitiveness yes. don't they yeah. just about to say that about yeah. the Nissan which was uh, well, and, and before that the, the Sierra Cosworths you know then then they, they brought in a two litre limit for the uh, British Touring Car Championship and Super 2000 was all the deal. And so then the two litre category, instead of being a, a bit player, um, became the only category. Um, so yes, it, it, it tends to be that somebody produces a great race car and then the, the, the legislation catches up. Um, there's always a little bit of lag between the gamekeeper and the poacher. And so we talked about yesterday Andy Rouse bringing a South African only market Mercure uh, XR4 Ti, which is a turbocharged four cylinder Sierra, which didn't exist in Europe or North or South America or anywhere else, but revolutionized in British touring cars and led it definitely and directly to the, uh, the, the building of the Sierra Cosworth and then its extrapolation, the RS500. And uh, those flame-breathing flame monsters were eventually uh, reined in and the two-litre cars took over. And then uh, in another generation into the 90s, the Nissan Skylines became the dominant force. And then Group A regs came in and, and they were sort of uh, reined in as well. In fact, the uh, Sierras, although they won all the races because they were the fastest cars out there, they kept taking points off each other, all the yeah. different teams. <laughs> and uh, in, uh, it was the BMWs that, uh, who were in the class below, yeah. uh, on the track at the same time, but in the up to two litre class. And uh, later, 2.3 litre uh, M3 BMWs actually won championship. Tim Harvey taking a championship in a BMW, of course, uh, who exactly now so. commentates on the current British Touring Car Championship. And again, you've got, you got a, a couple of different varieties of BMWs here. In the British Touring Car Championship would have been a 2-litre. In DTM, the same E30 M3 would have been a 2.5-litre engine. So it would have been racing against uh, the uh, 2.5, 16 Cosworth Mercedes, and then Audi's V8 limousine which came in with a, a five litre engine. So uh, all sorts of, of different rule sets. And the Acurios, Acuria Cos Cavalier is back in again. Possibly might have decided it's not slick weather. That car driven in period by David Leslie, run by Ray Malik Limited. So RML running those Cavaliers against the works Cavaliers with some success, not just with David Leslie, but also uh, Bobby Verdon Rowe, one of their other drivers. Uh, they had some uh, very entertaining races, taking the battle to the front of the field. The tier team and uh, Alistair McKay, the scion of, of the uh, Acura Cross uh, family, uh, Le Patron, Hugh McKay, had uh, an awful lot to do with 
with bringing Akurikos back into motorsport in Group C and in touring cars in the 80s. Safety car peels into the pit lane. We are getting ready to go back to racing once more. So the safety car and the pit stops have jumbled up the order of the cars on track. And as we come across the line, it is a Sierra Cosworth ahead of a Mark 1 Ford Escort, a BMW, a Rover and a Nissan, giving you a great idea of the variety here. But the Capri on the left-hand side of your shot, that is our race leader, Vim Kuhl. And we're looking for the car that should be in second place. So it's, that's not the leader's Capri. And still shown in second place is the Andy Middlehurst um, and Hansen Skyline, the red and black car, but that stopped outside the pit window. So I'm afraid James Hansen will have to serve a drive-through penalty. And is that the race leader? Yes, he is. So in traffic everywhere, that is Vim Kuhl. And he started in 11th place on the grid and bided his time in the opening couple of laps. But this Cosworth GA V6 engine Capri is absolutely flying. And at the moment, his advantage is four seconds over the red and black Tyson hat van skyline. There it is behind. That gap has come down at the restart. But that car must surely have to serve a drive through penalty in the remaining seven minutes. So James Hansen will have a lot of work to do, which will mean that the Max and Ian Goff RS500, car number 16, should be our de facto second place car and that is 1.6 seconds ahead of the Matt Neal and Henry Whale black and yellow escort so somewhere in all of the fast moving machinery there are battles going on don't expect us to find them <laughs> So Vim Kuhl working his way through this traffic. Of course, the safety car didn't pick up the leader. It just picked up the first car that came to it, not the race leader. And we haven't had a chance to have a wave around or a shuffle by. So everybody is in traffic. This is a confusing end to the race for everybody. And the uh, Harry Whale Escort, which is showing on our timing screens as fourth, is actually only just ahead of the leader. So it's probably about to go a lap down. I say probably because uh, it could be two laps down the way they've been going and shuffling around. Yeah. But I think probably just a lap down uh, in the escort. But uh, we have picked up number 53, Will Kuhl, who is the, the leader in that uh, absolutely fabulous looking Capri from the days when uh, big wheel arches and big tyres meant uh, you went faster and faster. And it looks great uh, up against the BMWs of the period. Oh, and there's another Cologne Capri out on the side of the circuit. That's the 63 car, and that was the, not the race leader, but uh, he's pulling off, and that's not good news because we, what we don't want is another safety car. And certainly what uh, James Hansen in well, still second place on the road doesn't want is a safety car because he has to serve a penalty in the next five minutes. Into the pit lane comes the escort. That's the guest family car with a puncture yeah oh and there's been a, a little spin there that's the car that was started by steve soper down the field at the wheel now so a car that it seems Soper raced in period and has there been a coming together with the number 10 bmw it looks like there might have been that's the car of mark smith were they together eight and ten they were they were battling for position one car off and one car with damage, and they were nose to tail on track. There was only eight tenths between them the last time in Beacon, so I sense there's been a coming together somewhere. And the leader comes through. So Ian Coyle, I don't know if he knows where he is in the race. I'm not sure how anybody could possibly know where they are in the race at the moment, because Wherever you were before the pit stops has been totally jumbled up. So now you just get your head down and charge and hopefully spot the checkered flag when it comes out. And uh, almost a second shaved off the lead from the car in, uh, which is still showing is in second place. We still don't have a marker on our screen to say that it's going to get a penalty. But we know but it we definitely came into the pit lane outside the pit window, so it should do. Going by uh, the 66 iconic escort, that's Nick Well and Alistair McKinnon's Mark II escort. Putting a lap on that car. Rick Wood, fastest race.
this lap now for the 1-2-3 Blue Calsonic Nissan Skyline. He is in fourth place, and he is nearly a lap behind the race leading Capri. Well, I don't know what Vim Cool possibly imagined might be the outcome of racing here at Silverstone, but maybe finishing on the Capri, uh, the Capri on the podium might not have been among his wildest imaginings. He has got James Hansen right behind him, coming alongside him, and the Skyline, unsurprisingly, 20 years the junior of the Capri with a lot more horsepower goes by and of course that four-wheel drive helping him uh, launch it off the slow corner but that car did stop outside the pit window quite clearly now whether there was a reason for that or whether they will get a penalty remains to be seen we have not been informed of one so on the road right now James Hansen the race leader in the red and black Skyline and in second place the white and blue 53 Cologne Capri. Third place is still the Max and Ian Goff Sierra RS500 car number 16. That's the Watson's water car. Looks like number six, but there is a bit of gaffer tape in front of the six to make it 16. That car is in third place. And fourth place, Rick Woods, Calsonic Skyline, still the quickest car out there. But has he got enough time left to catch them? I'm not sure he does. Now the spray on the straight has died down, Alistair. The drivers might be able to see their own pit ball, which will say, P what? Am I in seventh? No, that was a one. Another spin for the Mark 1 Escort. He had a, a loop around earlier in the hands of Ben Gill. That's his second rotation. And the, uh, the black and red Nissan just easing away now from Wim Kuhl in the Capri as they went through the Beckett's S's. There's our third-placed car, the Watson's Water car, which uh, is uh, just coming up the Hamilton Strait. And uh, the gap at the line last time was uh, a minute and 43, so uh, not in contention unless there's a problem ahead for the win. But uh, now we, we'll we the thought, did, did we think Max Goff stayed in and Ian Goff didn't take over? We didn't notice a driver change. No, we didn't see a driver. It, it all looked it, yeah. really calm, so it may, may be that Max Goff has stayed in. But here comes Rick Wood again with a head of steam. And uh, the Middlehurst Hansen car has just set the fastest race lap, 2 minutes 16.9. Rick Wood, 2 minutes 17.1, his fastest lap, but he looks like he may go quicker again this time round. Trying to chase down what may end up being second place, because Andy Middlehurst, James Hansen's car in trouble there. Another skyline facing in the wrong direction, this time looping half spin for Jonathan White in the silver and pink and purple and green and you name it, it's got it on it, Skyline. So Max Goff in the Watson's water, Sierra Cosworth keeping his margin intact. And the Skyline, Hansen slowed right down. Hansen dramatically slowing down on the straight. And that is an issue for the car that was the race leader. Capri has gone back in front. Vim Coyle leading with six seconds on the clock. Last lap drama for Andy Middlehurst and James Hansen. So whether or not they're due a penalty becomes irrelevant. That means that Max Goff is now second. There's a smoking BMW 2002. But the Cologne Capri is half a lap away from victory. It is the final lap of the race. And we have news from Ed Foster in the pit lane that the Capri is due a penalty as well for a short pit stop. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and uh, also the Skyline, which we knew about, for missing the window. And apparently they're going to apply the penalties after the race. Uh, so uh, uh, we don't really know. Is, does that mean Goff is in the lead? Well, that does mean Very Max possibly. Goff is leading from Rick Wood. It depends on the length of the penalty for the Capri. It would normally be, 30, I think, 30 seconds plus the short pit stop time. So with a lead of a minute and 40 seconds, he may well still hold on to the win. Now, does that mean that Mike Manning is third? The Neil and Whale car, Ed reckoned, was third, but that was a few minutes ago when they were fifth and knocked down to sixth position or seventh place. So... A penalty there for Vim Coyle for too short a pit stop. 
The Middlehurst Hansen car has stopped, and that may mean that we have a Sierra Cosworth winning this one. And the penalty for a short pit stop uh, is not 30 plus the short time, it's 10 seconds plus the short time Okay. he takes the flag. So he comes across the line and it now remains to be seen. Well, the Middlehurst Hansen car won't make it to the flag. There are two iconic escorts battling side by side. Whale versus Whale. Who came across the line first? It was 55, Henry Whale, ahead of Nick Whale, his dad. Or did Nick Whale start it? Nick Whale started it and Alistair McKinnon uh, took over, Harry Whale rather. Um, I'm getting my whales and my, my neels mixed up, but this may possibly be our race winner. Max Goff in the Watson's Water Sierra, Rick Wood in the Calsonic Nissan behind him at the line. And then already having taken the flag, Mike Manning in his Sierra Cosworth RS500. And that is the black Eggenberger Texaco Steve Soper liveried car and here Max Goff I don't know if he has any idea where he may or may not be in the race but if he does I hope he'll tell us applying penalties after the race I'm afraid never really works either for the commentators which obviously is my gripe uh, or for the fans Apply a penalty during a race, don't let cars get to the flag and then go, oh yeah, no, he didn't win it and he wasn't really third. It's, it's not, a, not a great way of running through things. However, it does seem that the Watson's Water Sierra RS500 coming out of the final corner will take the chequered flag, not first, but second on the road and 52.1 seconds behind Vim Curl in the Capri. So Coyle's penalty should be, it's been added on, has it? Okay, so 52 seconds, including the time penalty added in. And so does that mean that Vim Coyle has won it? And Max Goff second and Rick Wood, as he comes to the line, should be then in third place. And the car that might have the Andy Middlehurst James Hansen car has limped through to the pit lane and that's where it ah! ends its race. Ah! But that looks like a very happy Dutchman. Vim Coyle taking a surprise victory in the MRL Historic Touring Car Challenge. So despite a penalty for a slightly too short pit stop, there's a man who knows his car well. So, Dem Kuehl coming over from the Netherlands with this Ford Cologne Capri. And he ends up, it seems, on the top of the pile. So everybody rumbling back into the pit lane. Strikes me we still haven't had our podium for the last race, actually, but with all sorts of uh, confusion and rain and cars in the wrong place, didn't quite manage to get uh, our back-to-front winner onto the podium. However, we may catch up with that in a little while. As everybody now filters back in, huge grid of cars, 43 cars started this race, and only two or three fell to make it through to the end. Vim Coyle starting in 11th place. That's not bad at all. Again, when you talk about it's giving away a decade in, in terms of development and performance to a car like the Watson's Water Sierra Cosworth, and two decades in terms of performance and two wheel drive versus four wheel drive uh, compared to the 1990s Nissan Skylines. Because those Cologne Capris were all the rage back in 1974-75. It's quite a long way away from uh, some of the opposition they're up against. There's the uh, Eggenberger Capri. So that's Mike Manning's car. You just saw the Texaco livery car. Looks like he has finished in fourth place. And in the whale battle, Matt Neal and Harry Whale finishing just ahead of Nick Whale and uh, Alistair Killer. So there is the Watson.
Johnson's Water Sierra, and I think Max Goff was the only driver of that. We didn't see um, a driver change. And Rick Words in the Calsonic Skyline, there he is. So Rick Words, whose team were running both that car and the red and black. Tyson Advan car. He obviously says congratulations, warm congratulations to Vim Coyle who came from 11th on the grid and snatched it from everybody in some very mixed conditions. Crazy race with a, a wet, part wet, part dry circuit that dried two safety cars and a surprise winner. After random weather, safety cars, and some uh, rather haphazard pit stoppery, it is the Dutchman Vim Coyle's Cologne Capri from 1975 that wins the historic touring car challenge. Max Goff driving solo in the Sierra 500. RS500 finished second ahead of Rickwood Skyline. Mike Manning's Texaco Eggenberger Sierra in fourth ahead of the Middlehurst and Hansen Skyline, which finished its race in the pit lane. In the battle of father and son, it was Henry well and Matt Neal who triumphed over dad Nick Well and Alistair McKinnon. David Tomlinson's uh, Sierra Cosmos was in eighth ahead of the Bryant family Camaro and Steve Soper in one of his old cars finishing in the top ten. In the BMW Rover Camaro battles, BMW seemed to be in the ascendancy. Uh, Michael and Mike Whitaker's Rover SD1s just ahead of the Supercar V8 Holden Commodore in the tail end of the top 20. Well, Richard Dutton's Mark 1 Escort. I'm sure he will have had a thoughts before and after the race uh, for his longtime sparring partner, uh, Neil Brown, who passed away a few weeks ago. And uh, he finished just outside the top 20. Callum Lockie, uh, unexplained incident in the Julian Thomas started caliber RS 500s that could well have won this one, but went off at Cops Corner just after the driver change. A mammoth field of cars led by Sierra Cosworths and Nissan Skylines into streaming wet parts of the circuit. Half wet, half bone dry. What were the tyre choices? It seems the drivers were split between slicks and wets and early on there was not much to be gained for either. Julian Thomas leading in the Calibre Sierra, moving through past him, Max Goff in the Watson's Water Sierra. But as the track dried, suddenly the Skylines switched on their slicks and Rick Wood and Andy Middlehurst started to carve their way through. But the big surprise was Vim Coyle from the Netherlands in the 53 Cologne Capri. He survived two safety cars, a challenge from the Skyline and the weather to make the most of it and come through for victory. Max Goff driving solo in the Watson's Water Sierra finished in second. And after James Hansen's Skyline ground to a slow halt, it was left to Vim Coyle to reel off the laps and claim a surprise win.